Hey everybody, this is Andrew Greer here for CCM Magazine, and we are sitting down with our wonderful guest, Mark Larry. I can't tell you, my feelings are going back and forth between being really excited and being terrified. Why? <laughs> I just never know <laughs> what we might talk about or oh. get into. But you know, I, I was thinking about what we might talk about today, and it was I was thinking about all the facets of your career as a singer and celebrated recordings, Dove, Grammys, Gaither Vocal Band. I think of you as a songwriter, of course, and one of the most famous Christmas songs of all time with Mary Did You Know. I think of you as an author, as a comedian, and I think really in gospel music, I would consider Mark Lowry one of the broadest talents that wow. potentially we have Thank in you. gospel music so but it started with singing right yes. i was reading up growing up gospel music mama my mama <laughs> uh, when i was little she i was hyperactive so she, and i wasn't athletic so i she put me in music because our church was a big singing church the berean baptist church on 11th street in houston texas <laughs> independent fundamental, fundamental. baptist okay. serious but business. they loved to sing and so I was four years old the first time I sang in church. And, but I'd always sing in this little voice, the windows of heaven are open. And, but when I was home, I had another voice that was big and loud. And my dad gave me $5. He said, Mark, I'll give you $5 <laughs> if you'll sing in your big voice. So I did. The next Sunday, whenever they asked me, I sang in the big voice. Well, I came home that <laughs> that Sunday. With, I went around all the little old ladies. They were hugging me. I've, all, I've always loved old people. I love young people, and I love old people. Everything in between you could have. <laughs> young people are a clean slate. Old people are clean in their slate. And I loved to talk into both of those groups. But I was little, and I'd go around me. And I'd, Mama says she, I'd come home from church, and she would just, my pants would be full of nickels and dimes. From the old ladies? Little ladies would give me. <laughs> So I realized like, <laughs> there's gold in them hills. And, and so I never sang in the little voice again. <laughs> How did comedy, this is something I don't know that I've ever heard from you. Where did comedy, where did humor begin to really play into your, you know, your platform, uh, a side of music? Well, honestly, the Lord did call me to sing. I mean, really, I was headed in a whole different direction. I was in college, and... Um, it was a Sunday afternoon, and I was laying on my bed, and I was too awake to go to sleep and too hot and tired to get up. And there's no air conditioning in the dorm at Liberty Baptist College in Lynchburg, Virginia at that time. And I was just lying there, and whenever I can't go to sleep, I always pray because I know the Lord's upset about something. It seems like I need to confess a few things. <laughs> so I was praying, Lord, what have I done now? And uh, praying, and, and, and it's like the Lord spoke to me and said, why won't you do what I want you to do? And I said, what's that? And the Lord said, go into music. And I'm thinking music is something you do as a child. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to get a business degree and grow up. And so Is that was, what you were going to school yeah, for? Yeah. Really? And so I switched to youth instead of music. I knew I'd never learned to read music. It's too hard. It's too mathematical. And to me, it still looks like a bunch of white and black boys jumping over a fence. I've <laughs> never been able to read music. So... I switched to youth because I knew then once God called me, I knew what I was going to do. But the humor, which I've never considered myself a comedian, I've been labeled that, but a comedian is like a Seinfeld in my mind. He tells three jokes, changes the subject, tells three jokes, changes the subject, and it's brilliant. I love it. But you leave knowing nothing about him. Bill Cosby was one of my favorites because he told stories. And I love storytellers. The greatest preachers that would come through our church told stories. And that's the one thing that would hold my attention without medication <laughs> was a great story. And so when I started traveling and singing, Roy Morgan, who's with Premier Productions, big outfit now in the contemporary Christian world, he promotes all those big concerts. He graduated from Liberty, called me up and said, I want to book you. And I didn't know him. He was graduating too. He was, his job was to clean the dorms he was a student, you know. And I said, book me. Yeah, I thought, hey, I ain't got no bookings. Come to find out he could book a pork chop into a synagogue. He booked me <laughs> in 43 concerts in 41 days right <laughs> then. And I was gone on BBF, Baptist Bible Fellowship Directory. He pulled that out, hmm. called these independent Baptist preachers, and convinced them to let this Mark Lowry person come to their church. To sing. To sing. it, And then... While I was waiting on the little man in the back of the church to change those soundtracks, which can feel like an eternity <laughs> when people are staring at you, I started talking. 
and telling stories to kind of set up the next song, and people were started laughing. And at first I thought, why are they laughing at my testimony? <laughs> But then I thought, I'm on to something here. They're paying attention. And the only thing I've ever cared about, is, are they listening? Mm -hmm. If you can have the greatest content in the world, and if they ain't listening, what good is it? Mm -hmm. And so I, that, I started going with that more. Well, you're talking about filling time. I remember last year at the Dove Awards, and uh, it was me and Cindy Morgan, Jenny Owens, and the Point of Grace girls all sitting together. And here you come out. And they said, fill, what, 90 seconds or something, and you filled, you know, in eternity. Three but, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they did tell me three minutes right before I walked out. Oh, okay. Well, and I still had 90 seconds in my head. Oh, okay. Because so originally it was 90 seconds, and then they said, no, 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 we need you to stretch it. And that, so I did. And you did. And you did brilliantly. I mean, you know, award shows, we are so used to this, like, you know, kind of damper of an audience, and it's awkward, and there's all these transitions going on, and you just came out there, and you really brought people together uh, with story, not just with humor, but with story, right? And I love... Uh, you know, it's a Dogs Go to Heaven sketch, which of course has initiated and motivated this entire new DVD. But I love uh, the denominational humor because I, I think, you know, within the context of the Christian church, denominations are such a weird, strange, quirky, uh, and very funny, very yeah. funny thing. And so, I mean, I, I don't know how you get away with that. I mean, you had... I think as I know, I really love them. Mm -hmm. I think when... Because I love them all, man. If they love Jesus, I love them. I mean, I mean, and if they don't love Jesus, I'm going to love them. I'm mean, just saying, we all, all these different denominations have one thing in common, and that's Jesus. And so, it, you know, I think humor is great to shoot down sacred cows so you can see the cross. You know, we've got to shoot down the sacred cows. And because really, I have one goal, one goal. My entire career, has had, I've had one goal. And I just realized what it was this past year, even though it's always been there. Mm. My goal is to convince the world that a man rose from the dead. That's it. Whatever tools it takes, songwriting, humor, uh, book writing, blogging, Facebook. A lot of people are listening on Facebook now. And, uh, and that's why I will not do anything political. Because you wrap a flag around the cross, you make a moot point out of both of them. And my goal, this is one kingdom I'm concerned with, and it ain't America. I love America, mm -hmm. and I'm going to vote. But you'll never know how because it's none of your business. But my goal is through whatever means possible to try to convince people that a man rose from the dead. And that's it. Mm -hmm. There's this quote from the DVD. I was watching it um, last night on my exciting Friday night. And uh, it said, I'm not spiritual. You said, I'm not spiritual. I am curious. And the most fascinating thing I've ever encountered was God. Yes. And don't you think if we communed more uh, with curiosity uh, that our church fellowship and our faith experience, how would that open that up? I mean, I think that's what you're talking about here. My one goal, you're getting uh, to the core, uh, really was probably motivated by curiosity, throughout your whole life, curiosity has continued to lead you. Uh... Well, the Lord knows I'm, I have very short attention span, and He created me that way. And He keeps dropping diamonds on my journey that keep me moving forward. I'll meet a Gloria Gaither. I'll meet a Tony Campolo. I already know the right side of thinking, and I've met Christians on the left side of thinking. I mean, there are saved Democrats, no matter what anybody else thinks. And they love Jesus, and that's why they become Democrats, because uh -huh. they believe that's what Jesus would do. Well, my Jerry Falwell, he thought the same thing. Here's Jerry F I used to get Jerry Falwell's Christmas card and Tony Campolo's Christmas card and put them by side by side <laughs> on my refrigerator, knowing that both of these men love me. And I know both of these men, and I know both of them love Jesus and they came to separate political conclusions. Well, that's the reason I don't trust politics. Mm -hmm. I trust one thing, and that's that a man rose from the dead, and that's my message. And to add politics to that, I get, I, my heart breaks for people who do that because you've lost half your crowd. And are you trying to make them Republican or Christian? Right, right. What's well, your point? Where did, where did we get from where spirituality was the umbrella that we then placed everything under, including our politics, including whatever cultural issue and topic you want to put under that umbrella? But here, the kingdom, right, is, I think that's what Jesus you're talking Jesus said, about. I told you I got sheep you don't know about. <laughs> Well, look for them and quit trying to shoo them away. And yet, I love my Don't hear me that I'm not proud of my heritage. Let me tell you, they got his name right. Mm -hmm. And if they did nothing else, 
but get his name right, I will be forever grateful. And they handed me the word of God. They got their fingerprints all over it. And I spent my <laughs> life wiping off the fingerprints. But they handed me the truth. Yeah. And the more I explore that truth, the more I find out Jesus is very nice. And anybody who'd love you enough to die for you is on your side. And don't believe anybody who tells you God is mad at you. Do not believe anybody who tells you, you got to do this, 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 this before you come to Jesus. Come as you are. Come as you are. That's what I did, and he's still working. I ain't finished yet. Listen, I am a sinner. A man who says he has no sin is a liar, and the truth is not. It's not us and them. It's just us and him. We're all in the same boat. We're all a pack of freaks trying to find our way home, just like everybody else in the Bible but Jesus. King David, if he'd had Prozac, we'd never had Psalms. He was up one Psalm, down the next. Up one Psalm, down. Yo, God, you're wonderful. Oh, God, kill me. He was just like us. Mm -hmm. And broken pots spill more water. And if he'd had Prozac, look what we would have missed. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. life. I mean, life. In, in the kind of the art of being alive, which is where I feel like God intersects with us. It's actually in the living, you know, in the experience. And the, they make the best stories. <laughs> right. I cannot then, remember jokes mm -hmm. to save my life. Mm -hmm. Bill Gaither's always got a joke. You heard the one about, when anyone tells me you've heard the one about, my brain tunes out. <laughs> I'm no more interested, and I can look you right in the eye and be thinking about a million different things until you laugh at your joke, and then I will laugh and pretend I was listening. <laughs> but if you come up to me and say, did you hear what happened to me today? Mm -hmm. I'm all ears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Story being the, I mean, what God has allowed us to experience, so really... That is the most truth I know to tell, is the story, what I have experienced. And, and loving each other in that, it, this ties into, I wanted to ask you about the song, How We Love, which of course was the title track to your record last year, that Beth Nielsen Chapman, and I think Ugh. it's a poignant moment on the DVD, yeah. but uh, Beth Nielsen Chapman, for those who don't know who Beth is, you know, she's this probably one of the most respected Nashville songwriters and artists in her own right, but there's a line from it, I love the lyric, Sometimes we forget trying to be so strong in this world of right and wrong. That's where we're trying to get politics right and theology right and get everything packaged up in a box so God fits and then we feel good. And, um, and it says, uh, in this world of right and wrong, all that matters what when we're gone. All along. All, all that along, mattered, yeah. All along. Is how all we, we have that carries on is how we love. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in my home. I have this retreat at my home for people who like, to think outside the box. And, um, and Cynthia Clawson was there, and she sat down at the piano and started playing this song. Well, I have three dogs, and one I wish you'd pray for, because he's very sick, and he's old, and anyway, so. What's his name? His name is Bo, and I'm sad. But, um, she, but when I talked to my dogs, which I, I never had dogs before these dogs. I never owned a dog, never been around a dog. <laughs> But Bo adopted me, showed up on my back porch about 15, 13 years ago, and I started feeding him, and he stayed, and, you know, we became good friends. But whenever I talk to them, they'll tilt their head like they're really trying to understand me. It is so cool. That's why I always talk to them like they're my friend. I say, do you know what happened today? And they'll go, I mean, it's like they're really trying. Well, I felt myself when Cynthia started playing this song. Of course, that voice is the voice of the ages, that Cynthia Clausen voice. And I felt my head tilting. Mm -hmm. And I call it hearing from home. I know when I'm hearing from home. And I know when I'm hearing caca. Because First John says, you have no need that any man teach you. You have the Spirit of God living in you that will lead you into all truth. And I trust the Spirit in me. And I know when I'm hearing from home. I know what sounds like my father. And I know, and Paul asked the question, can good water and bad water come out of the same fountain? Yeah, it sure can, because I've heard it. <laughs> I've heard it when my pastor got up and he rung the bell, and I've heard it when he was just off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. And I don't say, I never let anybody know, I don't critique it over lunch after, you know, I don't do that. But I just know sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, and I know when they're right. I know when it's full of love and grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. And... So, what was the question? question? I, don't, I don't know. But, <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting. You talk about the spirit and hearing from home and yeah. where, where we have uh, potentially, you know, lost the trust 
in the spirit. I, I, you know, we, we work culturally, especially in Christian culture, to try to control the spirit in everyone else's life to direct them down this path. And I, I don't know where we became so controlled. Now, let me tell you what we're supposed to do. Okay. We're supposed to turn the light on. Mm. We're not supposed to preach. We're not supposed to, I mean, I just, yes, we are. Some are called to mm-hmm. preach. Some mm-hmm. are called to teach. Mm-hmm. My job's to turn the light on. And we're, if you do, and I think a preacher would want to do that too, because when you turn the light on, everybody can see from where they're seated what they need to get. Like right now, from my vantage point, I can see that cameraman over there. From your vantage point, you can see, I can't see them, Mm -hmm. but the light's on. Mm -hmm. And a great song should never preach. It should turn the light on. In my opinion, a great story. Anything I do, I don't want to chew your food for you. (laughs) Right. I want to set the buffet and you come get what you need. Mm -hmm. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 23, I think it is, somewhere at the end of Matthew. He looks at the Pharisees, which were the, the religious folks were the only people he ever chewed out. And can you imagine Jesus looking at you and saying, you've taken God's law which should be a banquet for all to come and feast. And you've bundled it into rules and you've loaded them down like pack animals and you won't lift a finger to help them up when they fall beneath the load. I've known preachers like that Mm -hmm. who take God's law, God's mercy and bundle it into rules as if rule keeping could save anybody. I mean, that's what sent Paul off on a tyrant against Peter. You're wanting to circumcise people again. How much, how good, what good did that do us except a lot of pain? You know? Yeah. So, Putting uh, these parameters around communion yeah. when communion has been made Trust available that to all. I, it's not my job to spank your kids. Right. It's God's job to spank his kids. It's my job to love them mm-hmm. and to woo them to Jesus. Just woo the bride to the bridegroom. That's. You know, and let him clean yeah, her up. Yeah, I've seen. You know, I've seen this kind of love. I, I wanted to talk about this because uh, I grew up. You know, uh, hearing and watching some of your uh, biggest parodies of like Amy Grant songs or Michael songs or Sandy songs. You know, and and uh, and yet they're all your friends. I think that's so interesting. <laughs> Make yeah. fun of them and they come. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting to me is I've seen uh, you, and I don't know that every one of your followers or fans or listeners or whatever always have seen or, or recognized this, but I've seen like in lives of some of your friends, folks like Sandy or Michael English, as some of their more personal struggles and failures have become public. And then they're under this scope of criticism, especially uh, by the ones that loved them so much. I've seen you continue to advocate and support them in a very um, sturdy, a quiet, spiritual, strong way. And I think that's all tying. It, it seems that you are really interested in the restoration of redemption and being a part of that story. Oh, I want to be a part people. of it. Yes. I need it for me. Lord, have mercy. The measure with which you judge is the measure with which you will be judged. Whatever you can get on a toothpick, I'll judge you with because I need mercy. I want to show mercy, I want to give mercy, and I want to receive mercy. And um, so, why not? I mean, good Lord. If everybody knew what I did, nobody would buy a ticket. I have sinned. I have messed up. There are days I wish to God I could go back and relive. But I can't. And I just hope no one ever finds out about them. But mercy. But mercy. Grace. Grace. God, God knows all about it. I'm not worried about him. Yeah. It's his people that scare me. Have you seen that bumper sticker, Jesus, please save me from your followers? <laughs> no. Well, they scare me. Yes, it's true. But no, no, I've never felt condemned in his presence. I've felt convicted, but I've never felt ashamed. You, If you feel ashamed in the presence of the Lord, you need to fire him. You've got the wrong one. Because mm-hmm. he would never. He, he'll, oh, he no. And when I'm really most in his presence is in the shower. I don't know why. But when it's I'm alone. I am not on stage. I and I let that water w- w- fall over me, and I just talk to him. And I and he's brought things up. Or I've had to jump out of the shower and still naked and go write an apology letter, or this, or go write a thought. He's given me great thoughts in the shower that have turned into stories, like um, one recently about that I wrote on my Facebook that got over 900 and something shares. Mm. And it was about turning the light on. It was all about that. 
And uh, because I just, I was reading that morning about how Jesus said, we are the light of the world. Well, you know, one script part of scripture, it says he is the light of the world. And then he goes on to say that we are. And so how do we turn the light on? And I was thinking about that in the shower and went and wrote this thing. And uh, I don't know, the shower, I don't know if it's that way for everybody. Everybody's got their place, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a place where we're spoken to, a place where we feel most... And he's the only one that can stand to see me naked. That's why I'm always alone in there. <laughs> but the story. Oh, the story. <laughs> well, Mark, I want you to know we are thankful that you do tell your story and that we get to be recipients of that story. And uh, thank you for talking with my us pleasure. today. 